You're listening to the La Jolla Cosmetic Podcast. Welcome everyone to the La Jolla Cosmetic Podcast. I'm your hostess, Monique Ramsey. And today I'd like to welcome Dr. John Smoot. And he is going to be talking about the internal bra, which is something we've done for a long time now, but it's now more well-known and talked about sort of on social media and in the press. And so it's something for augmentation patients. And so tell us, Dr. Smoot, what is the internal bra exactly? The internal bra is just a name for doing things that can't be seen on the outside. Now, it's a way to support tissue without being seen. It'll help lift and support tissues. That's essentially what it is. And so what kinds of cases would you recommend an internal bra for? Well, it depends on what each patient has to deal with. Basically, it's there, like we said, for support to elevate and reinforce tissues native tissues that have lost their integrity after years of weight gain, weight loss, children, nursing, age, such that, you know, a 50-year-old breast is not like a 20-year-old breast, just like an abdomen from a woman who's had no children versus one who's had children. The tissues get stretched and aged in a way that they don't look as good as they used to be. And so you need to do something to reinforce it. So would it ever be something that a primary breast augmentation would need? Rarely. It kind of depends what they're coming in for. Now, a woman who's had nice breasts before and then has had a couple of kids and now lost some weight and now things have stretched and begged, yes, then we might want to put something in to support the tissues as well as put an implant in. But it's mostly for that. It's to support the tissues back up to where they were. And so it doesn't mean that everyone who has an implant primarily needs to have one. It's usually a secondary type procedure to do. So could it be used in a surgery where you're not using implants, like a breast reduction or a lift or fat transfer breast dog, or does there need to be an implant involved? It usually involves an implant, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to have implants. Yes, you can use it on breast reductions. I've used it on occasion for that. That's usually not what we use it for, for just supporting just the tissue alone. It's more for when you have an implant, you want to resupport that bottom pole And I would think that if the tissue, like you say, you've had either kids and breastfeeding or the tissues or you're an older patient, it's, I guess, if you put a heavy implant in there, it sort of makes sense that you need something to help almost like a sling, maybe to sort of help so that that tissue doesn't have to take the whole weight of the implant by itself. That's right. And it's been around for a while. And I've used, over the years, I've used several different types of meshes. Now understand there's Patients get mixed up between meshes and we call ADMs. That's the collagen matrices that we put in, you know, like the the alloderm. It's it's cadaver skin, some pig skin, something like that, which is a totally different use for what you're trying to achieve here. I'll explain that in a minute. Okay. Does it matter if you have saline or silicone implants when you're using one of these? Is it a device? Would you call it a device? Yes. It doesn't matter. The type of device is not really significant. The size becomes significant. The quality of the tissues, the width of the breast, how big can you put in? Those things are more important than the actual style of implant. Now, if you get someone who's very thin and doesn't have much breast tissue, then yeah, silicone becomes a much better choice because it is more natural feeling. It's less palpable. You see less rippling with a silicone implant versus a saline implant. Now, if you're having this mesh, I guess we're talking about mesh, right? Now, I'm, now I'm already confused about the ADM and the mesh. Yeah. No, just we'll talk about mesh. And we'll... <laughs> okay. So with that mesh, now, is that something that the patient, is it something that you could see? No, your nerves, you're never going to see this. Now, what it is, if you, when we say mesh, it's, it's literally like a mesh screen. If I was to take it out and show you, it, it looks something similar to that. Now, what it's made of is it's a a bioabsorbable material. It's called poly-4-hydroxybutyrate, what we call P4-HB, or in the common area, it's Galaflex. That's what we call it. And it is a bioabsorbable material. It breaks down through a hydrolysis procedure, so it gets bioabsorbed over time. But what it does do over time is it creates a scaffolding of thicker tissue, so it has more strength to it. 
even though it dissolves. Now, we've used the permanent meshes in the past and had a lot of problems with those. So this is really good because it will not last. Now, you mentioned, is it palpable? If someone is very thin, they don't have much coverage when you put it in there. Yes, you might be able to feel this for a while, but it typically does dissolve over time. Okay. And could the patient feel it on the inside? No, you'd feel it on the outside. Okay. Like when they feel underneath the breast, they can feel the the edges of the graft sometimes, the mesh graft. But again, it it's, has to do with how much tissue we have to work with. Uh-huh. Somebody who's very thin and, and got a lot of sagging, yeah, that you might be able to feel that. Yeah. But then, like you say, over time, it's going to dissolve and your own body's sort of right. creating the structure. And how long does that take? It takes about 18 to 24 months. Oh, interesting. So it takes a while. Now, does the patient need to think differently about recovery in any way with either exercise or lifting, or is everything kind of the same as you would tell a breast augmentation patient? It's pretty much the same. But most of the time we're using this and we're doing lifts and resupporting and retaking out excess skin and sometimes some tissue to keep the breast shape. So that's usually why we're putting it in there for. And the recovery is pretty much the same whether I use it or not. The question more is in terms of how much do I need to do? Is it just an implant? Is it an implant and a lift? Is it implant, a lift, and reinforcing the tissues? The only downside about the mesh is that it costs a little more. Oh. But it does prevent some long-term problems. When girls come in and say, you know, I want to do one more seat procedure, and it's the last one. I want you to do everything possible to keep me looking nice. Well, then, yeah, we, we consider some of these meshes and some of, the, some of the ADMs we talked about. Okay, so let's go back to that the mesh versus the ADM. So the mesh is actually, like you say, a scaffold that will dissolve over time that your body kind of integrates with. So what's the ADM? The ADMs is for a different purpose. That's not necessarily for support. We use ADMs for capsules. In other words, when girls say my implants got hard, there's this tissue and to keep, keep it, but to lessen that, we use the ADMs. That's where we want to keep it soft and feeling natural. But the mesh is not used to prevent or to treat capsules. Now, some people have said that to some degree, but there's no proof out there right now that it does do that. It might, but we'll know in time as we do more studies. So the ADM, does it wrap around the implant or what does it look like? And I guess when it's in you, what, where is it? There's two kinds. There's cadaver skin, human skin that's treated and it's becomes just made of collagen. There's also what we call pig skin which is called stratus. Now, both work equally well, and people freak out when they say, oh, you're putting pigs in me? Well, yeah, we've been using this in heart valves and other things for many, many years. So it's been proven to be safe. But when you look at it, if I took it out of the package, it looked like white, wet cardboard. That's what it looks like. But it's just collagen. And you, you almost never can feel it. You can't put it in there. Now, depending on what we're trying to accomplish, we can wrap the entire implant in this stuff. We prefer not to. Usually it sits in the bottom part of the breast, like a half moon support bra, like a couplet that sits in there. We just sew it into the tissues. It gets integrated into the breast tissues. And for the most part, it it stays there for a long time. I've had a few times it's been chewed up by the body and removed, but not very often. Interesting. But it really works though. I mean, it and we've done some podcasts on this before. Yeah, so some pe- we did one on kind of revision breast surgeries and the different types you might need and what they all mean. And so that's very interesting. So for the person who might have gotten either really bad capsules or keeps getting capsules, then this is where you might lead them to right. choose. We wouldn't be using a mesh. We'd be using the ADMs. Uh-huh. That's correct. This is for someone who just, no matter what you do, they just keep bottoming out. They have no support. You've got to give something to support and create that new fold and make sure that fold doesn't descend. Mm -hmm. Now, how many times do you think you've done this internal bra procedure? I've probably done 50 to 100 of them, be my guess. Uh I mean, I've done a lot more ADMs because that's kind of the nature of my practice is doing this revisionary surgery. So, but again, I've used it. I don't use it all the time, but there are times when it is necessary to use. Now, what do patients usually say after they're through recovery and they see their results? Well, usually it does work. Now, it doesn't always work perfectly. Nothing's 100%. 
but it does tend to keep that shape up. The most times where I use this is where the implant has descended and dropped down below their fold. And so their the implant has, is lower than their breast, which is called a double bubble. And now you've got to reinforce that tissue because it's weak. And if you just try to sew it down, a lot of times it doesn't work. You have to reinforce that fold. And that's what that is used for, is to reinforce and get that nice round shape again. Now, do patients who might have had a few surgeries, like a second or a third breast surgery, does it take them longer to recover? Or is it kind of however their body recovers? It doesn't really matter whether it's, it's all the a little first. Different. It's never as hard as the first time. Oh. But again, that's variable because if I have to sew the pockets down and put some of the grafting material or the mesh in there, I have to sew it to the long rib and that's what hurts. Oh. But it that's what gives the strength. Now it's a long time for a few weeks, but it's not the same pain you have when we have to put the implant in and release the muscle and put it into the muscle. Yeah, that actually, just you saying that, I was thinking of my next question, which is, You know, I remember I've been in this business now 30 years. So, you know, there's been trends in breast augmentation over the muscle. Everybody's doing subglandular, meaning it's on top of the muscle, the breast implant sitting on top. Then everybody was moving to submuscular where the implant goes behind the muscle. I have two questions. One is, what do you tend to do more of now and why? And then the second question is, when you're using this internal bra, does it matter whether you're going over or under the muscle? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, that just was for, a lot. <laughs> just your first one. The trend is, well, again, this is my experience over 35 years of doing this. I almost never go above the muscle. Hmm. It initially looks good, yes, but the long-term consequences are usually not good. It's a higher rate of hardening or capsular contracture. It can sometimes thin out and you get that half dome look or they, there's no support in the tissues because it's a weight, like a rock and a sock type look. So I tend to put them under the muscle. That tends to maintain the shape, hold its position better, and give it a more natural look. The only drawback to the muscle is that when you flex, yeah, they can move a little bit. But I ask women how often you go around flexing your pecs. <laughs> so it's usually not a big deal. Now, when we use either one of those items, either the mesh or the, the ADM, and we're talking about mesh today, I tend to put it as a, like a half cup, a half, like a couplet, I should have brought a piece here and showed you what it looked like. I didn't think about it. But you just sew it into the muscle and you sew it into the fold. So it creates a little sling in there. So that's why I like to do it. Can you use it above the muscle? Yeah, but you don't have anything to anchor it to. Oh. It's a little more difficult to anchor. Okay. Well, that makes sense. And we'll put in the show notes. We'll get some pictures of it. And then we can put some links in the show notes for everybody who's listening to go look at what we're talking about in each of these cases. So. For patients who are thinking about cost, you know, revision breast surgery ranges between, let's say, 11500 to 16500 You know, we have all our pricing on our website. We have ranges for a reason because everybody's a little different type of implant, et cetera. Does it add a lot of cost to include the Galaflex? It does. I mean, it's not inexpensive, but it's not overly expensive either. Sometimes I use these products as a prophylactic measure. An insurance measure. Like they say, look, I'm going to do this one more time and I want you to do everything you can to keep this looking good. Okay, well, then we need to consider this. Yeah, there are times it. when I just say, no, you need to have this material. Uh-huh. And everyone's a little different. But I think that when I talk to patients, money's not on my forefront, in my mind. I don't talk the money. I don't talk the cost and prices. I talk about what I can do to make it work. And I am sensitive to budgetary items. I don't like to just run the cost up because I can, but I only suggest things if I think it's going to be of some help. But sometimes right. it's okay. Half does one way, six ways the other, you know, uh-huh. to a certain degree. And I don't say it's up to the patient. There are times you say, no, you need this. Yeah. Well, it's probably cheaper than having another surgery down the road. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, That's exactly what I tell them. Whatever that ends up being. And, you know, and this is where I think the issue for financing really comes up because a lot of people don't realize that you can finance your surgery. It can help a lot. And maybe you don't finance all of it. Maybe you have a certain amount saved up and then you finance the rest because maybe it was more than you thought. And that makes it a way that, you know, it we're very easy to talk to about money because it's a concern for everybody. It's We can't pretend like it doesn't exist. So I think having 
knowing that there are tools and that our team will help you figure out what's the best way to make this work for your budget so that you can say yes if you need it you know then it makes that a little bit easier right and it's you know sometimes it's a little more cost up front but if you have to come back for second or third surgery cuz you got a little too conservative and then you're not doing anybody any good mm -hmm. okay so I'm, I'm very honest about that. I'm not terribly aggressive when I do, but I'd like to be very clear. I really want my patients to be educated when I talk about these products and why I'm using and what are the alternatives. And, you know, sometimes it's, well, I, I can't afford this. Okay, well, then we'll taper something to your budget. But again, my focus isn't say, okay, how can I maximize the profits of these procedures? That's not what's <laughs> on my mind. Well, you're, you want the result, right? You want the best result possible. I mean, it's just, you know, you'll think if mom ain't happy, nobody's happy. You know, if my patients aren't happy, nobody's happy. Right, right. So like I said, we have another podcast talking about breast augmentation revision with Dr. Smoot. It's a great episode. So go back. It was one of the first ones we did. So go back a little bit. We're now up to like 57 episodes, which is so cool. So we'll link that in the show notes. And then we'll also have some links to pictures on our website with breast augmentation revisions. So you can take a look at that. Now, Dr. Smoot, can people, I would assume now that kind of we're in this post-COVID world, people come in for in-person consultations, but if they want to, can they still do a virtual consultation with you? Well, absolutely. There's no problem we can do it virtual. It is limited though, because particularly when you're talking about firmness and positions, it's hard to tell in a Zoom consult. But I can get some idea to say, yeah, yes, you're going to need this, you're going to need that. And we'll talk more in detail when I actually see them in person. But it's a good start for someone who just wants to get some information. And or if they're out of town, you know, that's the other thing. We do have oh, patients yeah. travel a lot of times to see our doctors for surgery. And so it's a good way to kind of get that first step. So if you're listening today and you have questions and need information about scheduling, financing, reviews, or photos, check our show notes for links. We'll have all of those there. We'll also get some pictures of the Galaflex and the Stratus which is that ADM, so that you can kind of have an idea of what we're talking about there, of a good visual. And Dr. Smoot, anything else that you wanted to mention about this procedure? There's a few things in our business that have really been remarkably in, in terms of changing the outcomes. And one of them was those ADMs. That was a real game changer. For women who've had implants and then had multiple problems with capsules or deformities and Will I ever have nice looking breasts again? And that's, that's been a game changer to, to correct those problems where beforehand it was just like, well, I can try it again or, or take your implants out. Now, the Galaflex is a little different. The mesh is a little different what it's doing, but it's more for reshaping and supportive issues. And again, it very much helps. It's one of the tools we have to have some outcomes that are good. Again, I'm not trying to toot my own horn on this, but in terms of these revisions, I've, I've kind of got... You know, instead of doing the straight, easy cases, I get all the hard ones. <laughs> Isn't that fun? <laughs> when, you, when you're so good at what you do that you get all the hard stuff. <laughs> yeah, but again, it, it's taken me 25 years since I started using this stuff to learn how to use it well. Mm -hmm. And now when I first started using these things, it was kind of poo-pooed and, oh, it doesn't work. And and now it's like everybody uses it. Uh huh. And so I, and I was out there teaching and talking about this and there's a lot of skeptics, but now it's pretty much part and parcel of all of our practices now. So wonderful to talk with you again this morning. Thanks for taking time out of your day. Thank you, and I hope this was helpful for all of you. And if you liked it, please give us a little review wherever you listen to your podcasts and tell your friends, share it out. And um, we'll see you again next time, Dr. Well, Smith. Just let everyone know that I'm more than happy to see if they have questions. At least to come in and talk. We don't have to make any commitments, but women are listening to this and thought they could never have their breasts fixed. There are options out there. I'm not going to say I'm the only one who knows how to do this. I'm not, but I, I've got some experience in it. So That's wonderful. All right. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Take a screenshot of this podcast episode with your phone and show it at your consultation or appointment or mention the promo code podcast to receive $25 off any service or product of $50 or more at La Jolla Cosmetics.
La Jolla Cosmetic is located just off the I-5 San Diego Freeway in the Zymed Building on the Scripps Memorial Hospital campus. To learn more, go to ljcsc.com or follow the team on Instagram at ljcsc. The La Jolla Cosmetic Podcast is a production of The Axis, T-H-E-A-X-I-S dot I-O.